Yeah, I'm uh, Aaron, and this is my colleague Nina, and we are going to be giving the talk on developing a mental model of Istio. Uh, and so, at uh, at Solar, our organization, um, there are you know a number of people who are contributors to Istio or leaders. Like we are on definitely in the user camp, and so this kind of chronicles uh, our journey for understanding you know how how ambient Istio works and how to interact with it. Um, so, yeah, let's get started. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we will, um, so in this talk, uh, yeah, we'll talk about our journey of, of how we learned um, the differences in Istio's API. So, ambient is not a drop-in replacement. So there are differences in how uh, the API is used in sidecar versus ambient mode. And this was a difficult thing for us to wrap our heads around. And so it kind of helped to dig a little bit deeper and understand what's happening under the hood uh, in order to uh, develop that mental model of exactly why, uh, why we're seeing what we're seeing and like how to effectively use ambient. So that hopefully you should get that out of this talk. Um, so I'm going to start here just thinking about some of the abstractions of Kubernetes. And we're going to focus on the service abstraction, since it's the most relevant for service mesh. And so these abstractions can be implemented in a number of ways under the hood. Uh, and we'll use that to motivate our journey. So we start off with a service in plain Kubernetes. And even here, there are many different ways to implement it. But this is one that I think um, we're all familiar with. And so um, what I'm doing here is I'm actually breaking the abstraction a little bit. And so how many of you have programmed with the Go programming language? Yes, okay. So when learning that, um, learning how interfaces work and learning how slices work, uh, the way my mind works, I kind of had to think of them as like the, the structures that they were under the hood, like an interface being like a pointer to data and then a pointer to like type information stuff. I don't really care the details, but, but just knowing that kind of explained some of the weird behaviors that, that, uh, that, that Go can, can uh, uh, that you can see in Go. So this is kind of similar, like knowing what's under the hood can explain a lot. So here we go with, with plain old Kubernetes. And when you have a service, uh, you typically interact with it via a, um, a, a URL, right? Which is written according to some convention. And the idea is that your application will hit this URL and Kubernetes will route it correctly. So a service is, is an abstraction for a number of pods and you don't care how many pods there are or what's happening to them. You just want it to go to one of those pods. And Kubernetes delivers, right? And so the way that works under the hood, for example, is by writing this URL that follows a convention, so it's like the service name dot namespace dot svc dot cluster dot local or whatever the, the you know, domain is, um, your application makes a DNS request. And Kubernetes has a DNS server which answers that request. And it returns a fake IP address. So uh, called a, a, a VIP or virtual IP, right? And so there's nothing in the cluster that actually has this address, like no pod, no node. It's just a value. It's a value that Kubernetes picked in order to associate this, this value with, with a service, right? So you, you get this, this fake IP back and then your container makes a request. And this is where the magic happens under the hood. So there's another component called kube proxy, which configures the Linux kernel to take that fake IP address and then do something interesting with it. In this case, we load balance it um, across a number of services. So some complexity under the hood, but just having a general high level idea of what's happening under the hood is helpful here. Now let's introduce Istio with sidecars into the mix. So the picture looks fairly similar, uh, but there are some key differences. Number one, our pods grew. So we have our application container in it, but we also have a few other containers, um, one of which is Pilot, Agent, and Envoy. But they s serve some of the similar roles. So you make a request to the URL, hasn't changed, but this time you go to um, 
Istio's DNS. You can enable D is the DNS capture in Istio. So this is Istio's notion of what DNS should be. And so it can override what Kubernetes thinks. And th this is actually a rather powerful thing. But in this case, we're just looking at the service abstraction. It doesn't. So let's say it returns the same virtual IP. And then some, the same magic happens under the hood with IP tables rules and the traffic goes somewhere else. So it goes to a kind of proxy. So instead of going to cube proxy, which load balances it, it goes to an envoy instance. This is the sidecar that's in the pod. And that envoy instance does a similar thing. It load balances that request and picks a pod to send the request to. Uh, the key, one well, key difference here is that it just doesn't send the traffic um, unaltered, it wraps it in an MTLS connection, so a secure connection to the other pod, right? So it's encrypted, it reaches the Envoy instance, the sidecar in the other pod, is decrypted, and once it is decrypted, it is sent to the, uh, to the uh, destination container. So we added some, some value add here, but it's fundamentally the same pattern and it uses the same abstraction, so it's, it's not all that different, okay? But now we can push the boundaries of that abstraction. Let's say we want to have this URL, linuxfoundation.org slash baz, right? And we want a container in our, our mesh. Whenever it uh, makes a request to that URL, we don't want it to go to like whatever the public DNS is for that and through an ingress gateway, what have you. We want to short circuit that and just send that to the pod that will, that will answer it. You know, we just want that to stay in the mesh and be simple. So that's something you could do in Istio. And it's a very similar path. But you have a different URL. The request goes to DNS. And maybe it returns like a different, uh, a different virtual IP. But ultimately, at that point, Istio does the, the same thing as before. And the request goes to its, 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 uh, its intended destination. But this starts to like, then we can start to break out of this, 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 this service abstraction because that's not really something that you can easily do with, with, the, the, with the, uh, service, the, the, the service custom resource in Kubernetes. And then we can add things to this. Like let's say that there are 20 pods that, that, um, that like implement slash baz and let's say another path uh, foo or something has a different set of pods, and we want to route traffic to you know different uh, you know different sets of pods based upon the path, and so that's like a form of routing, and that definitely brings us out of the the comfort zone of the service abstraction in Kubernetes. So this is where we get into uh, Istio's API itself. So like these are some selected uh, resources in Istio's API. In this talk, we're going to focus about on virtual service and authorization policy. Um, but when thinking about Istio's API, it is very helpful to consider where this API is being implemented. What proxy is this happening in? So these on, uh, on one side, the virtual service, destination rule, and service entry, these all happen in the Envoy instance of the pod that is making the request, the client or consumer sidecar. There's various different terminologies that are used. So like that routing decision, okay, based upon, based upon path or maybe, maybe you're doing a, a canary rollout or, or like blue-green testing and have and, and shifting traffic to some percentage like that. In, uh, in the sidecar-based mesh, that happens um, that happens on the requester side in their Envoy instance. And it's doing something you know, more complex than just plain old load balancing. Now, as far as the destination pod, the, the server or producer sidecar, these APIs, peer authentication, authorization policy, request authentication, are kind of inherently, um, inherently happen on the server side. So like, we'll be focusing on authorization policy, uh, you know, it makes it, it makes sense for a, uh, the the sidecar of a pod to uh, determine who gets who gets in it. That's something you would not delegate to uh, the requester. Uh, so, with sidecar-based Istio, this is kind of your mental model of the API and where it's implemented, and and all is good. So, Ambient changes things a little bit, and. You know, with 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 Istio, uh, with with, with sidecar-based, you know, the Envoy proxy is kind of doing both uh, L4 level, like like just just IP-based, and uh, uh, layer seven um, 
processing in the, in the Envoy instance. Istio splits that apart. So um, it has a secure overlay layer, uh, which is implemented through Z-Tunnels, which basically is responsible for point-to-point -point security, and not a whole lot much else. And this is, this is kind of, I think that's where the name Ambient came from. I mean, it's, it's just around. These East tunnels are just around, and, you know, the magic happens under the hood, and you get secure um, communication point-to-point -point between pods in the mesh. But Layer 7 is where they really start to differ. And Layer 7 is where you do policy that requires knowing about things like what HTTP is, what an HTTP method is, what a path is, and all that sort of stuff. So like um, routing is an example. But let's go back to our service abstraction, right? So here we have, um, here we have our service abstraction in, in Ambient. And fundamentally, it, it doesn't look all that different from the others. Uh, the pods shrunk. We no longer have sidecars in it. But we have a DNS. We have a virtual IP. We have some IP tables rules or something which is directing these fake uh, IPs to, 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 uh, to a Z-tunnel, okay? And the Z-tunnel is what does the uh, load balancing and encryption. It, it does a slightly different spin on MTLS called HBone. Um, I think it's HTTP-based overlay network, and I don't remember what the E is, so let's just say it's excellent. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, so, so basically it's, 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 it's essentially just tunneling the traffic uh, still MTLS encrypted, and it goes to a corresponding Z tunnel and then to the application. Um, there are some differences here in the sense that in, uh, in ambient Z tunnels are a daemon set, so they exist on each node. But as far as our mental model is concerned, like, we don't care all that much. Like, the Z tunnel, like, it, it could, could, be, could be a sidecar for all we care. It could be, like, who, like, who cares where it is? It, it basically is responsible for, um, for providing this point-to-point -point, um, Secure communication. It does not do any L7 stuff, and you know we really don't need to think about it all that much, or at least as far as like our mental model is concerned. Okay. Now, when we think about L7, that's when things really start to get different. So, the sidecar model up in that corner, we have one uh, pod communicating to another, and we see the client has virtual service, destination rule, etc. Um, that's the old sidecar model. Now, with Ambient. You have to explicitly opt into L7, and furthermore, um, that occurs only on the server side. So there is no sidecar on the client side. So if you look at the traffic, it goes from your pod to a Z tunnel, and then if the destination has a waypoint, it goes through that waypoint. Policy is enacted, and then it goes onto the pod. So if you look at the API, um, that's implemented in the waypoint, we see authorization policy, peer authentication, request authentication, everything that previously was on the server side. But now we also see virtual service and destination rule on the server side. But they're not exactly the same, okay? They, they um, are scoped differently. So the waypoint in Ambient is scoped to a service account or a namespace. So it's like a given app, this is my waypoint. I deployed it. It is, it, is, it is in my security umbrella or such. It's in my namespace, and I control it. I'm the only one that controls policy for it, and all traffic has to go through my waypoint. And so that does place some limits on what you can do with virtual service or destination rule, right? But here's the analogy that, like, really worked for me, at least, when trying to figure out... Um, we're trying to think of this thing. So, like, imagine if some of the patterns we see in service mesh happen in the outside world, right? Now, obviously, it doesn't, but let's, let's just think about it this way. So, we have Lars and Anna here, okay? The top scenario, Lars's scenario, is similar to the sidecar world in Istio. And in that world, Lars's computer would need to know would need to know stuff like routing rules. Like, it would need to know that if you're going to cncf.org slash project slash spire, there, it, it would need to know the, the possible endpoints for it and, like, maybe other policy. Like, maybe there's a canary rollout going on. So it would need to know to send 90% of its traffic here, 10% there. Like, all the routing decisions are made on the client side, right? 
But that, that, that really can't work in the real world, right? Because like at internet scale, like you would, you know, you would have almost infinite policy that, that, that the clients would uh, need, to, uh, need to implement. And like there would be a lot of, lot of trust thrown around. Like you would uh, need to uh, believe that the clients are, are, are enacting this policy. So this, this wouldn't work in the real world. In a constrained environment like a mesh, yes. Real world, no. So the real world is more like the lower picture, Anna. She um, follows a URL and it goes through an ingress and that ingress then knows the, the various um, policy, routing rules, etc. It knows that the slash spire endpoint will load balance between two endpoints and it's in a canary rollout and 90% of the traffic will be going here. So, you know, that analogy is kind of powerful for understanding, you know, what happens in, 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 in ambient. So, in the sidecar-based API, you can create a virtual destination and, and say, okay, I want you to route your traffic in this way. And where you is any other pod in the mesh, any other namespace. Okay, so like, so me, you know, can, can, can tell you what to do. Um, in the ambient way, if you opt into a waypoint, I mean, it is basically an ingress. And it's something that you control and you create policy in it, and any traffic that comes to you goes through your waypoint, and you are solely responsible for the policy that is in that waypoint. And like there are various aspects of the of the existing Istio API that like that don't that don't work in that model. Like export two, for example, is a field on virtual service. That's that's the one that tells like, hey, you namespace, you have to route it this way, et cetera. So like this is this is for for me at least this was kind of the the key analogy or insight which explains which explains a number of things. Like this also explains why Istio decided to use the gateway API. Cuz that's basically what you're doing. You're essentially creating an ingress to a service, a gateway to a service as such. And so it's it's a it's a really it's a really good fit. But, you know, I think in general it it uh, you know, it helps to understand given a service mesh and an API where is it implemented? Like, find the proxies and and figure out is a client side, server side, and then like w once you go through that in your head, you, c you can develop a mental model of how things work. So for like you know, for Sidecar, for for Ambient, for something like Linkerd, for something like Cilium Mesh when, when that's out, you know that type of thinking for us at least was very illuminating for understanding how to. Um, how to use the API of the mesh and why the API of Istio uh, differs a little bit between Sidecar and Ambient. So if this is a little bit cerebral, uh, Nina's gonna take it to, with some concrete examples and, and show like some of these differences in action. And we have a, a couple of local VMs running and we'll give a little demo here. Yeah, so um, yeah, let's, so uh, all of this, hopefully the demo gods are with me today. Um, but I have, uh, so let's reload, or where is it? Um, I have a repo if you wanna follow along or do it on your own later, which walks through the examples I'm gonna do today. Um, and if everything falls apart, we also have a recording. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. So like Aaron mentioned, we have two VMs, uh, both running to uh, a kind cluster each. So on the left here, I have my sidecar cluster, and this is running uh, Istio in sidecar mode. So if you notice, uh, the example I'm gonna use is uh, the classic Istio one, so book info. Um, and I have everything in book info deployed. Um, and all of these have uh, a sidecar, right? So the uh, uh, Istio proxy here has been injected already. And it's injected for everything in book info. And then uh, looking here, I also have Istio D. So uh, that's, that's my control plane that's running. Then if we take a look at cluster two, um, we have uh, ambient installed here. So in ambient mode, the first thing you might notice is that there are no sidecars. So the only things I have uh, for everything in book info is my curl container and uh, the actual book info app. Um, cool, and then uh, I, in this uh, example, we actually have two nodes. So on the first node, you might notice uh, because the Z tunnel is running on a daemon set, each uh, node has its own Z tunnel. Um, and uh, the book info has been split across uh, those like that. Cool. 
Um, so now, demo time. <laughs> so hopefully, uh, a sidecar demo, and then uh, ambient. So I scripted it up so I don't have any butterfingers, um, but again, like you can look at the steps uh, on the, the GitHub repo. Uh, is that font too small? Let's, let's make it a little bigger. Okay, cool. So um, what I'm gonna do is apply the same policies in both clusters and see what happens. So the first thing we're gonna do is apply uh, an, a layer seven authorization policy. So the layer seven authorization policy we're applying in both clusters is completely identical, and it's only gonna allow product page uh, to hit ratings. So let's apply that now. Apply this one. So um, the first, uh, well, we'll run in parallel. Um, we're gonna send our first request from product page and hit ratings. So this should go through because the L4 policy will allow it. So we're gonna run that and run that in ambient and we get the same response. Um, and now we're gonna do the same thing, but um, you know, try curling from a, a, a pod that doesn't have permissions, right? So uh, we're going in this case from reviews, which isn't allowed to ratings, so let's see what happens. So in the sidecar mode, we get an RBAC access denied 403. In the ambient mode, we get this uh, command terminated with exit code 56. So what's happening here? Um, if we go back <laughs> to our ambient cluster, you can notice that we don't have any waypoints right now, so all of this uh, access policy is getting enforced at the Z tunnel level. So that's why you're getting the different response in sidecar versus ambient. Cool. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's go up to level, level seven, uh, layer seven. <laughs> so uh, the policy we're gonna apply first is gonna be completely identical. So we're gonna try matching on the ratings app, and then um, uh, we're gonna try adding a, a header match. So if Istio is cool is present in the header, and we're coming from product page, we uh, allow the traffic. If it's not, then we block it. So let's apply it. We applied it, applied it there, and now let's send some traffic. So remember, right now in ambient, we don't have a waypoint. So there's no way, way of actually enforcing that this header is there. But in sidecar, we don't really care because the sidecar is injected to everything. So um, if we run the sidecar request first, uh, going from product page to uh, reviews with the header passes. Um, and then when we go from uh, product page with the incorrect header, this should be blocked. So we see the RBAC access denied again. Um, but in ambient, if we go from product page to ratings with no waypoint, we get the same response, we're blocked. So before when uh, we didn't have the header, we were uh, allowing that traffic. Now, um, because we can't enforce it, we're blocking it. So, um, and you can see the same thing when we do uh, a, a similar experiment going from reviews to uh, ratings, you're still being blocked there as well. All right, and then the last thing um, that we wanna check on the sidecar case is can we still go from reviews? Uh, so is this still being enforced, the, the principles? Um, we're going from uh, reviews to ratings and then having the correct header, and then this is also denied. So let's fix the ambient case. The way we, we're gonna fix this is uh, we have to change, uh, first we have to apply our gateway. So um, the, uh, we're gonna use the gateway API to create a waypoint. So the waypoint is gonna be the policy enforcing point that's gonna enforce our um, L7 authorization policy. So let me apply that. Uh, and you can notice that the one I'm gonna use for this example is per service account. So I'm gonna select the book info ratings service account and scope the waypoint to that. Cool, okay. And then the second thing we have to do is, uh, well, first let's check that the waypoint came up because, um, cool. So we, 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 it looks like we have our waypoint already running um, since five seconds ago. Um, but if we go back to K9s and look at the waypoint YAML, um, we can see that we're actually, in our authorization policy, we're gonna select the waypoint and apply the L7 authorization policy there instead of using the app ratings, um, like pod labels, right? So we're gonna use this Istio gateway uh, label to, to apply a policy. Let's apply it. So this is the policy we're gonna apply. Again, I, like I mentioned, we're switching the, the label here. and then let's, uh, let's send some traffic. So let's do the same three tests we did before, product page to uh, ratings with the correct header first, so this should go through, right? 
So we get our ratings response. And now we're gonna do the same thing, uh, product page uh, two ratings with a bad header. So not Istio. We get our RBAC denied. So this is, again, like you can notice that uh, now that it's going through the waypoint, we actually get the 403 response. It's not the, um, the exit error that we were getting earlier. Okay, last test. Uh, let's go from reviews to ratings with the correct header, just to sanity check that nothing broke. And we're denied again. Cool, so the next thing I'm gonna show is how the authorization policy and an L7 policy works together. So I'm gonna create a virtual uh, service and again, it's gonna be the same virtual service in both the sidecar case and the Ambien case because the API hasn't changed, right? So uh, we're gonna create a virtual service for ratings where we're gonna in, uh, add a fault injection uh, to return 14 when um, we hit ratings. So let's apply that. And we already have the ratings waypoint, right? So the waypoint is what's gonna be enforcing it in the Ambien case. So applied it. Now let's send some traffic. So the first thing we're gonna do is same test again, product page to ratings with the correct header. Um, and in both cases, we're gonna get the correct response. Um, now we're gonna do the same thing, but go from reviews to ratings um, with the, yeah, the correct header too, but it doesn't really matter for that. Um, so what do you think is gonna happen in the sidecar case? How many people think we're gonna get fault filter abort? No? How many people think we're gonna get the RBAC? Okay, let's, uh, let's try it. So in the sidecar case, we get fault filter abort, but in the ambient case, we get RBAC access denied. So the reason this is happening is what Aaron explained. Instead of having the sidecar uh, do the routing or apply the um, you know, fault injection policies and, and things like that on the client side, now we have a waypoint that scopes it to the service account. So you don't have a sidecar which uh, applies the fault injection before you hit um, the server um, side sidecar. Now all of that is getting applied at the waypoint. So this is why you're getting two different res uh, responses in both cases. All right, last example we're gonna run through is uh, we're gonna do a traffic shift. So um, we're gonna apply a new virtual service to reviews and reviews is gonna go 90% uh, to V1 and then 10% to V2. Um, so let's go apply that. And uh, the other thing we have to do in order to get this to work is we have to apply destination rule. So the destination rule um, is going to select which subsets we care about on the service. So it's the same destination rule in both cases again. Um, so we're gonna apply that. Um, and the extra thing we have to do in the Ambien case is we have to create a, a waypoint for reviews because the last gateway we uh, created the waypoint with um, was only scoped to the ratings service account, right? So we need a, a new one for uh, reviews. So uh, same uh, idea as before, we're gonna use the, um, the service account uh, here uh, to only create a waypoint for reviews. Um, and let's apply that. Cool, and then uh, let's double check that the waypoint actually got created. <laughs> So it looks like now we have a, a new uh, waypoint for reviews running. And uh, now let's actually send some traffic. So um, I have um, Prometheus port forwarded here um, on 9090 for ambient. And then I have uh, Prometheus port forwarded here for uh, the sidecar case on uh, 9091. So let's uh, go, go to Prometheus copy that over, and we're gonna see uh, how many Istio total requests that we're getting from um, going to reviews v1 versus the total. So when I execute this, it might take a couple minutes to get, uh, yeah, so um, like I, I, we looked at the, the policy before, 10% is going to v1 or to v2, and then 90% uh, should be going to v1. So if I execute that, that's about, it's hard to see, let me zoom in, uh, about 90% going to v1 and then 10% uh, to V2, and then in ambient, the same thing. So V1, um, uh, about 90%, and then the same thing for V2, about 
So uh, that's all I had to show demo-wise. Um, I encourage you to try it out on your own. Um, this is based on the getting started with Istio Ambient um, and uses the 118 alpha uh, version there and, and it has instructions on how to set everything up um, and you know set up a local client cluster yourself. So uh, without further ado, let's go back to the slides. Is it? I think all we have left is, a, is the QR code for feedback. Yes. <laughs> Well, I think we also have a, we're promoting our uh, panel. So uh, oh, yes. getting started with Istio, and then uh, if you're interested in asking more questions, there's uh, a panel coming up um, about uh, the future of service mesh. So uh, feel free to also attend that. But I think we have some time for questions, right? Yeah, I think so. Great, yeah, so uh, are there any questions? There's a question there. Uh, is there some logistical necessity for mics? Oh, there's mics right there, I think, standing in the hall or the. Or how about I'll, I'll run around. Okay. In, Z tunnel, in the first Z tunnel slide, you show the IP table tools. Probably you are there uh, somehow configuring the. Uh, not entries for, for the services and redirecting the traffic to the Z tunnel and, and yeah. the waypoint proxy. Yeah, right. And so, like, it's the Z tunnel that knows whether a waypoint exists and whether it needs to uh, send traffic to the um, to the waypoint. But also, like, even IP tables is kind of an implementation detail because, like, there's different ways you can implement it. You can do that part in eBPF. You can do like you can do it in, in, in IP tables. Just, I think that's the first implementation that's there. If, the, if the underlying CNA is helium with eBPF and with proxy re replacement, does this still also work on it? Uh, it's so it's the so I guess the question is like, um, could it go to Waypoint if you have like another another CNI or something in there? So the thing is that um, so the Z tunnel is is specifically the component that has the logic in it that um, that. So it knows whether there is a waypoint, and it knows if traffic needs to be directed to that waypoint. So if something else uh, is like it exists that can have such logic that in theory, like you, you know, that component could send it to the waypoint instead. But as far as like where ambient is right now, Z tunnel is right now the one thing that 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 knows that logic and knows where like if it needs to send the request to another Z tunnel or to a waypoint. So there's actually a number of of opportunities for for implementing it differently or like putting other twists on it. But it's still the early days and so like this so what I described is you know how it exists now. Um, so I think yeah we have a few more minutes. Oh yeah first uh, just a request to go to the slide with the GitHub. Yeah, I have a question. When when do you how do how do you choose wh where to scope the waypoint service account or the namespace? Ah yes. Well, I mean that is so as it stands now, you are allowed to choose both, and I think so. It depends upon the layer of the level of granularity you want. In some cases, there's really no distinction between them. Like you have one surface account for a namespace, and so like a namespace one would be sufficient. So it's it's in those cases where you have a namespace, and for whatever reason you you do have uh, pods from a number of surface accounts in them. That's just an additional tool for providing the appropriate granularity. The 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 underlying concept is that the um, is that like the granularity of so thinking of the waypoint as a kind of ind ingress um, I mean you are kind of at the whim of the granularity that it defines for that for that waypoint and the tools that are given to you right now are namespace or service account but you know, who knows what, where we'll go in the future. So but. If you would choose, for example, this, the namespace, but you have service accounts and you want to enforce policies in between those service accounts, can you do that still? Well, yeah, you, I mean, you, you would need to deploy the waypoints uh, with, with service account granularity for that. And I don't know, I don't recall if any of our workshops have that as, as an example. 
No, okay. But, but no, they do with book info because um, there is, we do have an example with book info and different service accounts for product page ratings and reviews. And so like in that scenario, um, maybe we'll be, we'll be in touch because we did, we did, at our booth we did have an instruct workshop that I think showed that scenario where you do have uh, multiple apps with different service accounts in the same namespace and enforcing policy between them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But because if you would deploy a per service account and you would have in every single service service account and it would be the same as like kind of sidecar because you would have the same amount of waypoints as like well not necessarily be yeah you I mean you might I mean I mean the, the, it's it's decoupled because like if you have one service per service account then yes it it, it reduces to something that is very similar to sidecars but in in the case where you have like 20 pods or so that, yeah, that, that that's, are behind that yeah, service, yeah, yeah. that's where you, you know, and, and imagine the ability to scale the waypoint differently. Like suppose that one waypoint will serve 50 pods just fine. Or maybe in your use case, you're heavily L7 biased. And so like you have to configure it so that like maybe five waypoints can serve like a pool of 50 pods. You, you have yeah, the ability to dial in the, the, yeah. the you know, what, what um, the, the amount of, uh, uh, waypoints to pods, which can totally vary based upon situation. And, and, and the example I gave, you could also have it like on the book info namespace because all, oh yeah, all the virtual services uh, are the things doing the routing and applying the, uh, the authorization, like, you know, you're applying it to ratings in that example. So I could have shown the same example and just created uh, a, a gate, gateway for the namespace and it would have worked in that case. Okay. It just depends on like your, the way you want to scale. So. Right. Okay. Thanks. Hi, is there still time to ask a question? So, yeah. Yeah, thanks for your talk, first of all. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, my question is, with Istio in sidecar mode, um, usually if you have some kind of batch processing in Kubernetes, like a job, mm -hmm. you have to wait for the sidecar to come up um, before you can actually do your thing and make requests. Um, is that something I still have to care for with the ambient mesh, or is it so fast that I... Well, so, so what happens is that... Um, you know, in, in ambient, you label namespaces. So the, so the question is, do, like, do you, do you need to wait, f like with sidecars, you kind of need to wait for the sidecars to start before, b before they can start enacting policy. Um, in Waypoint, because, um, because the Z tunnels and because the waypoints already exist, um, it's actually a very, very fast uh, loop because you, you, you label a namespace for ambient and then like the CNI is constantly watching for pods that appear and disappear. And, you know, basically at the point that a pod comes into existence and, you know, gets its networking all set up, then, you know, the redirection to the Z tunnel, which is already up, um, or waypoints, if the Z tunnel needs to route to waypoints, that's, that's all, um, that's all already there. So it's really just that initial step that sets up the capture, like either an IP tables rules or, or whatever it is that's implementing that. And that's, that's really fast. So there's nothing, there, there's no pod that you need to wait for. It's just, you know, waiting for the, you know, the, the, the correct re the redirection to the Z tunnel. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the. Do we still have time? Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah thanks for the talk. Uh, I really appreciate it, and it gave me a, a good insight to Istio. Um, my question is: When would I want to use ambient mode versus sidecars? T till now, I only see I get less pods, less memory usage. Are there any other benefits? Yeah, uh, you should definitely attend the panel, you know, uh, late, late, later today. But, but yeah, resource usage is, you know, is is a major one. Um, you know, there's there, like there's, um, you know, you could have what's that? Migrating. Yeah, like, gradually like adding. You, yeah, okay. <laughs> so uh, also, uh, like you uh, in sidecar mode, you you know inject everything with the sidecar. Here you can like add you know L7 as you need it, right? Um, and uh, add you know things to the mesh more gradually. So if you just care about like basic L4 observability and like MTLS, then you can just have you know no policies in place on L7, but um, get like pretty good you know performance, less uh, memory consumption, um, and not have to you know inject pods everywhere. So it's, um, it, it, there's also other benefits of like slowly migrating, like as you need, you add the pieces you need, so. Yeah. 
And so we're heading into break, and so we'll have time if you would just want to, you know, meet, cluster together here to answer questions. But I think, you know, this session is, is officially over.